a sweet presence in worship this afternoon. God is so good. He's so faithful. He loves us so much. And I hope you were able to experience the presence of experience the presence of God this afternoon in your home or wherever it is that you have been. We just want to thank you guys for joining with us. Before we get into the message today, I, I have a verse that I want to share with you guys from Psalms chapter 34. And I just want you to listen to this. Maybe if it's something that speaks to your heart, write it down, highlight it in your Bible, remember it, because it's, it's during these difficult times that we need something to hang on to, and the Word of God is an anchor for us. The Word of God is something that we can latch on to and say, this is my hope. Listen to these words. I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and rescued me from all my fears. Some of us, we need rescuing from our fears. But when we seek the Lord, he will answer us. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This is David talking about himself. He said, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. This is our God. This is our God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. This is the word of God. This is the word of God for us. And I just want to encourage you, grab a hold of the word of God. Grab a hold of his word. And in these difficult times, maybe you're tempted to be afraid. Maybe something is taking your emotions here and there, and you're tempted to be afraid. Say, no, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he rescued me from all my fears. Grab a hold of the word of God. Put it in, your, put it in the pocket of your heart. Take it with you wherever you go. And remind yourself over and over again, no. God's going to rescue me from my fears. God's going to rescue me from my fears. He is a good God. He is my God. And I will put my hope and trust in him. And everyone who does will never be put to shame. Stand on his promises. Today, tomorrow, each and every day, stand upon the promises of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for leading us into the presence of God. Thank you, guys. Well, once again, I want to thank you guys for joining with us today, whether you're watching at home with your family or on a computer with your small group, or maybe you're just by yourself in your room somewhere. Thank you so much for joining with us and joining service with us this weekend. We're going to continue. We're going to continue in our uh, series that we've been doing for the last several weeks now. We've been doing a series based on the Ten Commandments. And so far, we've gone through uh, Commandments 1 through 6. And today, we're going to talk about Command number 7. But before we do that, I have a short story that I want to tell you guys. And uh, I'm only going to tell you part of the story, and I'll finish the story later on. One day, there was a, a father, and he went with his son to a store. 
And at this store, they sold all different kinds of things, some hardware and uh, some bits and pieces to fix things. Uh, they sold some fruits and vegetables there at the store. It was kind of a, a store where you can buy all sorts of things. It wasn't a very big store, just a small store. And one of the things that they owned, one of the things that they had at the store were these jars of candy. And the father knew the owner of the store. They were good friends. They had been friends for a long time since their, uh, their days in school and everything. And so the father and the shopkeeper, they, uh, ha they were good friends. And so the father went to visit his friend, but also he needed to buy a few things. But he brought his little son along with him. And his, the son was about six or seven years old. And so the father and the shopkeeper got chatting, and they were talking about a few different things here and there. And the son was wandering up and down the aisles, looking around at the different stuff that was in the store. And then the, 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 the son saw one of these big jars that he had there. The shopkeeper had one of these big jars, and in the jar was candy, all these little candies. And so, you know, the, the son says to his dad, Dad, can I have some candy? Can I have some candy? And because the dad and the shopkeeper were such very good friends, the shopkeeper said to the son, you can go ahead. You can reach in, and you can grab as many candies as you can. Just put your hand in there and just grab as many candies as you possibly can. And you can take those home for you. Uh, you can take them home for free. And I won't charge you anything. So the son thought about it for a minute, but then he wouldn't do anything. He didn't say anything. He was just real quiet, put his hands behind his back. And uh, the shopkeeper repeated himself. He said, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and take some candy. Put your hand in there. Grab a bunch of candy. But the son, he didn't, he didn't want to put his, put his hand in there and get some candy. And so then the shopkeeper repeated it one more time, a third time. And he was starting to get a little bit, maybe he was getting a little bit, uh, just starting to wonder, you know, why, why isn't this kid? You know, kids love candy. Why He even asked for the candy. Why wouldn't he just dump his hand in there and grab as much candy as he could. And so then finally, the, the dad himself was starting to get frustrated with the son. He said, go ahead, son, take the candy. He said, you could go ahead, get the candy. But the son was just put his hands behind his back, didn't say anything. And so at that point, you know, the, the father was frustrated, a little bit angry at his son because he wasn't accepting the gift from his friend. The the shopkeeper was a little bit frustrated and not understanding why the son who wanted something so bad, why he wouldn't just reach in and grab it himself. And uh, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story at the end, so you guys have to pay attention if you want to hear the rest of the story. All right, so I'm just going to stop right there, and there's a, you'll hear the rest later, okay? So today we're going to talk about the seventh commandment. Now, last week we talked about the commandment, thou shalt not murder. Okay, and we learned about how that is a good uh, commandment, and it's the principle of love. Today we're going to talk about the seventh commandment, and the seventh commandment goes like this. You shall not commit adultery. That's the seventh command. Five words, one command, you shall not commit adultery. This Command is the principle of intimacy. For each one of the commands, we've tied a principle to each one of them. This command, we're calling it the principle of intimacy. The principle of intimacy. So we're talking about adultery here. And we're talking about how we can guard our hearts and we can guard our lives to live a principle, to live a lifestyle, to live a life that is committed, and to live a life of intimacy with your spouse. God has said in, his, in the Bible, it says that, that marriage is for one man and one woman, and the two shall be committed to each other, and they shall live um, and be committed until death. That's God's command for, uh, for marriage. And this one, this command is talking about that in, in the fact where God wants us to be faithful. God wants us to be true. 
God wants us to be uh, committed with all of our hearts to one person. If we think about all of the relationships that we have in our lives, the marriage relationship, the marriage relationship is the closest relationship that we have that shows the love of God that God has for us as people. And it's meant to be the deepest love, the most committed love, the most intimate love that one person can have with another person. And that's God's plan for marriage. And it's his example of the closest we can actually see to God's commitment to us. God's commitment to us is forever. He's made a covenant relationship with us through the death of his son Jesus. And it's a commitment that's forever. And this marriage relationship is meant to be the same way. A man and a woman commit themselves to each other in marriage. And for the rest of their lives, the rest of their lives, they're committed, faithful to each other, helping each other, honoring each other, living for each other, encouraging each other. That's the principle of intimacy. That's the principle of true committed relationship. And because God sees this relationship as so important, because God values this so much, he made a command about it that says, don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. Don't be unfaithful to your spouse. Do not do it. Hang on to that. Guard it. Protect it. Everything you can do, make sure that you are committed and live a life of commitment and truthfulness and faithfulness to your spouse. How do people commit adultery? Well, there are three ways, and there are, these are our three points for today. The first one would be in our body, okay? The other two, soul and spirit, okay? So we'll get to those other two in just a minute. But we're going to talk about adultery in the body. 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Okay? I want you to see that very clearly. Sexually immoral person sins against, not against another person, against his own body. So when someone commits sexual immorality or adultery, it's sinning against their own body. It's like they're betraying themselves. It's a betrayal of yourself. That's what the Bible says right here. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So this verse is telling us that our body, our lives, don't belong to us. And if you commit sexual immorality or adultery, you're sinning against your own body. You're sinning against the body that belongs to Jesus. You're harming yourself. The person who does this is harming themselves. So this says, flee from sexual immorality. Run. 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 Run away from sexual immorality. That's what the Bible says. Get away from it as fast as you can. Like when Joseph, Joseph is the, the classic example. In the Old Testament, he was working in Pharaoh's house. He was a servant, and the wife of Pharaoh was coming, coming on to him, and he, he, he saw the situation, and he ran. He didn't try to talk his way out of it. He didn't try to reason his way out of it. He didn't try to, oh, maybe I can be strong in this. No, he just took off. He ran. He said, I'm out of here. And that's what this verse is saying. Flee from sexual immorality. We can glorify God in our body. We can glorify him by remaining pure, by running away 
from sexual immorality, from, by staying away from these things that will destroy our body. See, the beauty of this is that God created sex. God created sexual relationships between a husband and wife. And he created it in a good way. He created it, and he made it happen, and everything that God has put inside of us, the desires for pleasure and that, that's all, that's all from God. It's his creation. God created us in this way. But he said, this is good, but do it in my way. Because if you don't do it in my way, then it's going to bring destruction to you. It's going to bring heartache. It's going to bring pain. It's going to bring sorrow to you. It's going to be sinning against your own body. Okay? But all of these things have to be within the, the promised covenant of marriage. That's how God created sex to be, in the covenant of marriage. Not outside of marriage, not before marriage, not with someone you're not committed to, in marriage. Okay? God knows our bodies. God created our bodies. And he knows all of the desires that he's put within us. He knows the difficult desires that we face. He knows the ones that we have to have control over. But he made those things because he's a good God and he knows the good things. But he wants us to live a life that honors him even in our body. So adultery can, can be in our body. Okay? Also, adultery can be in our soul. We can commit adultery in our soul. Now, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. You can commit adultery. You can live a sexually immoral, immoral life in your mind. Maybe you don't do it. Maybe you don't do it with your body, but you think about it in your mind. We can have thoughts, wrong thoughts about a person or wrong thoughts about this situation or that situation or maybe you have, maybe people have a certain thought about this or a certain thought about that. We have to control our minds. We have to get control in the way that we think. We can also have, um, we can also commit adultery in the way that we, in our feelings and in our hearts as well. Sometimes if you're getting too close to a person that it's improper and, and, and you're having desires that are, that are not moral, they're not true, they're not good, you have to be careful of that. You have to watch yourself. Don't commit adultery. Don't have sexual immorality in your heart or in your emotions. Okay, we have to, we have to be careful of that. Sometimes we have a group of people, they'll make decisions based on what they think, based on the way somebody thinks or the way that my mind goes this way. Maybe the other group of people have, make decisions or they have feelings based on their emotions. But we have to make sure that in our mind and in our emotions, they're not leading us. We're not being led by impure thoughts. We're not being led by the desires that we see in the world or this or that. We're not being led by our emotions or, you know, my feelings. I feel this, so I got to do that. We're not led by that. We're led by the Word of God. We're led by the Spirit of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Self-control is a, is a fruit of the Spirit. So we need to make sure that we are walking according to the Spirit and not letting our soul lead our lives. Any thought or any emotion that stirs up love before its time is an inappropriate thought or emotion. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 5, it says, 
do not awaken love. It means don't start love, don't wake it up before it's the right time. And in relationships, in the words you say, you have to be careful. In the thoughts that you think, you have to be careful. Don't let love just run away and wake up and take you somewhere you don't want to go. But say, no, I'm going to have self-control. I'm, I'm going to live within the boundaries that God has placed for me. I'm going to live a, a pure life. And if you're not married, you wait until you're married. If you're married already, let the boundaries of your, your marriage relationship be the boundaries that God has for you. And enjoy the life that God has for you, but don't go outside of those boundaries. Because as we saw before, it will destroy you. Listen to this verse in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Destroys his own soul. So number one, this person is foolish. They, they, they lack understanding. But also they destroy their own soul. Think about that for a minute. Who wants to destroy their own soul? It means to spoil something. It means your soul begins to rot. It becomes corrupted. It means it's, what happens when you have leftovers in your fridge and it starts to spoil? You have, maybe you had some meat sitting in your fridge and then it starts to go bad, maybe it moldy, starts to stink. What do you do with it? Just throw it in the garbage. It's good for nothing. You're not going to eat it. You're not going to... This says you're rotting your own soul. Your soul begins to spoil. I don't want my soul to spoil. I don't want to be good for nothing. I don't want my soul to be wrecked and ruined and, 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 and gross. I want to protect what God has given to me. Last week, we talked about things that led up to murder. We talked about hatred, anger, offenses, all of those things leading to, to murder. What leads to adultery? Lust precedes adultery. Lust is when you're trying to get something in a sexually immoral way that's only about you getting something. That's about your carnal desires, your evil desires to get something for yourself. That's what lust would be. It would be this, this craving for, for something, an uncontrolled cra craving. You can't control it yourself. You have to put the boundaries in place. You have to say no to those things or else that will lead you to adultery. But looking can precede lust as well. Listen to these verses in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 28. This is the words of Jesus. He says, You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. So he is, Jesus here, he's referring to this verse in Exodus chapter 20. He's talking about the commands of Moses where it says, do not commit adultery. He said, this is what they've said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman and lusts for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's the looking combined with the lusting. So when you look and you lust, and that leads to adultery in your heart, but it can also lead to adultery in action as well. Think about other, other uh, examples in the Bible. We talked about Joseph a minute ago. Potiphar's wife, in Genesis chapter 39, verse 7, listen to what it says about Potiphar's wife. It says that Potiphar's wife cast longing eyes at Joseph. Potiphar saw Joseph, and Potiphar, her, Potiphar's wife lusted 
after Joseph. Cast longing eyes after him, lusted after him, and went after him. And now he was a wise young man. He ran away. He fled away from her. He ended up in prison, but better to be in prison than to commit sexual immorality. Okay, he made a good choice there. Think about David and Bathsheba. David was up on his roof, and he saw Bathsheba. So looking, combined with lust, leads to immorality and adultery in our hearts. But then this is what Job says in Job 31, verse 1. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully on a woman. I made a covenant with my eyes. It's like saying, I'm making a promise. Okay? Maybe I see something, but I, I'm making a promise. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to guard myself. I'm going to stand. I'm going to have self-control. And I say, I am not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Look away. Run away. Flee. Do whatever you have to do. But get away from that because it'll kill you. It'll destroy your soul. It'll destroy your body. The last way that, we, that people commit adultery is in our spirits. Something happens in the spirit with adultery. We could also say with sexual immorality as well. This is how Genesis 2 verse 24 describes marriage. is with Adam and Eve, okay? And remember, this is before the fall, so this is before sin. And this is what God says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So there's a leaving, and there's a holding fast to something. Okay? Adam and Eve, Adam didn't have to leave because he didn't have a mom and dad. But God was using the principle of Adam and Eve to say, for those of us who have parents, there comes a point when you leave and hold fast to something. You're leaving one thing, but you're grabbing on to something new. Okay? And that's what marriage is. It's saying it's the beginning of a new family. Okay? You had your family before. You lived in your family before. The kids lived with the parents Okay, but now, on the wedding day, you say, I do, and it's a new family. So you're leaving one. You're still connected. You still have a relationship with your parents, but this is your family. This is your new family. So it's a leaving, and it's a holding on to. But there's something that happens in the sexual relationship that brings the two people together. Okay? And as we look, this verse in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, was repeated several times. God, uh, Jesus himself used it in Matthew 19, Mark 10. Paul the Apostle talks about it in 1 Corinthians 6 and in Ephesians 5. And then this is what, this is what uh, uh, Paul says as well. Do you not know that your bodies are, member of, are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. In a person's spirit, when a person commits adultery, if they're married... When, when, when the, okay, let me kind of just backtrack a little bit. When two people are married, they're joined together in body, soul, and spirit. It's a beautiful thing that God created. But when a person commits adultery, a person has to leave who he's supposed to cleave to and joins himself with somebody else. And so there's a breaking. There's a breaking in body, soul, and spirit, that intimacy that he's supposed to keep with his, spouse, with his wife, with the man's supposed to keep with his wife, that the wife's supposed to keep with his, his, her husband. 
And there's a breaking of that relationship. What was meant to be joined together is now broken because the unfaithful spouse has joined himself together with somebody else. And it breaks the most beautiful of relationships that God has created for man to experience with another person. It's broken that. And now the man or the woman who's unfaithful goes and joins himself to somebody else. And the spirit is broken inside. It says, But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. There's also not just a breaking of relationship with the other spouse, but there's also a breaking of relationship with the Lord as well. You're choosing to walk away from what God has created. And it continues on to say, it says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. The thing about sexual immorality and adultery, it's never just an isolated sin. It's never just immorality or adultery by itself. There's always deception. There's always lies. There's always covering things up. There's also a lot of pride that's involved as well. Selfishness. All of these things are joined together all of these sins are joined together in the sin of adultery. It's not just a, a random act of sin, but the person who's committing adultery has to live in this lifestyle, separating themselves from God, separating themselves from their spouse in order to, to do this. And if you're not connected to God, what are you connected to? If your spirit is disconnected from God, what are you connecting yourself to? The spirit of adultery, spirits of lying, spirits of deception, spirits of pride, spirits of selfishness. All of these things are the things that you're submitting yourself to, that a person is submitting themselves to in when, when they are submitting themselves in, in sinning and adultery. So let's make sure that we are not sinning in our bodies or in our souls and damaging our spirits in the process. Let's compare the two. Adultery, or we could say sexual immorality, or waiting until marriage and purity. Okay? A person who lives in adultery is controlled by, the, by lust. They are controlled by lust. A person who is faithful is self-controlled, controlled by the Spirit. A person who lives in adultery is weak because they're just following their own passions and their own desires. They're just grabbing whatever they can. It's, it's not controlled. It's just wild and, and, and uncontrolled. They're weak. They can't control themselves. But a person who's faithful, a person who waits until marriage, is a person who is strong because they're controlling. They're watching over themselves. They're controlling themselves. A person who lives in adultery or sexual immorality has to sneak around. They have to sneak around. But someone who waits in, until marriage, they can live in, in the light. They can live in purity. They can live boldly before other people because they're accountable to their leaders and their pastors and to everybody around them. It's not a, a secret what they're doing. They can live in boldness. They can live in the light. A person who who doesn't wait or lives in sexual, sexual immorality, has no commitment. There's no commitment with sexual immorality. There's just, I'll do whatever I want to do, and it's all about me, and I'm making my own thing. And, but waiting until marriage, marriage is a beautiful commitment. It's a beautiful commitment because you're saying, from now until we die, we're together. We're committed. With adultery, there's uncertainty. In marriage, the bonds of marriage, there's peace. In sexual immorality, it's a temporary, unfulfilling pleasure. But in marriage, it's a lifetime 
It's a lifetime of pleasure. Adultery and sexual immorality will destroy you. But a marriage relationship, a faithful marriage relationship, will bring you life. A sexually immoral lifestyle is a lifestyle that takes. It takes. But a committed marriage relationship is a lifestyle that receives. In our story, I started the, the story uh, of the little boy. And the little boy said, he said to himself, nope, I'm not going to take anything. I'm going to, he said, nope, I'm not putting my hand in the jar. I'm not going to grab the candy. And so then what ended up happening, the, the dad was mad, the, the shopkeeper was frustrated. And, uh, but, but the little boy, he wouldn't say anything. He just stood there with his arms behind his back, wouldn't put his hand in to get a handful of candy. So then what the shopkeeper ended up doing, the shopkeeper himself threw his hand in the, in the big jar, grabbed a handful of candy, put it in the bag, and gave it to the kid. And then the kid was all smiling and happy, and they walked out the door. And the dad said, the dad said to his son, as they were walking out the door, he said, why did you do that? He said, you embarrassed me. He said, I wanted you to, you know, grab the candy. I wanted you to do that. And the son said, yeah, but his hands are bigger than my hands. His hands are bigger than my hands. I got more candy because he put more candy in my bag than I could have grabbed by myself. God's hands are bigger than your hands. God's hands are bigger than your hands. Don't be someone who takes and takes and takes and takes and takes. Be someone who submits to the Lord and receives. Because what God has for you is better than what you could grab for yourself. Now, I understand that there are all, all types of people who are watching today. Maybe, maybe you've fallen into the sin of sexual immorality or even adultery. God is a God who restores. We talked about three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Jesus, when he, gave, when he had his ministry on the earth, it says that Jesus saved, Jesus healed, Jesus delivered. But it was all one word. It was the Greek word sozo. And that word sozo means a healing in your body, healing in your soul, and healing in your spirit. And that's what God has for each one of us and for each one of you. So if you have lived a lifestyle of immorality before, it's not too big for God to restore. There's no sin that's too big for God to restore. What I would encourage you to do is to meet with somebody and just confess. James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's a healing when we confess with our mouths and forsake what we've done in our past and in our lives. Trust the Lord Jesus. Pray with somebody. Pray the prayer of faith. Put your hope in God. Repent. Give yourself to him completely and fully. Trust his power. Trust his deliverance. Trust his healing. Trust his salvation. Because it's true and it's real. Let me just pray with you before we finish. Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray God, for each person who's listening to this message today, I just thank you for their lives and I thank you for your word. And I speak hope to them in the name of Jesus. I speak hope 
to them in the name of Jesus. And I speak life and I speak restoration. God, for every person who maybe has given themselves to sexual immorality or, or adultery, Lord, your forgiveness is enough. And God, I just speak your life into them, oh God. I pray that, there, that, you, that this word would bring hope, <coughs> hope into them, oh God. Hope into them. Bring them hope in the form of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, I thank you for their lives. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your warnings so that we can live in the blessed life that you have for us. And God, I pray for healing, salvation, hope, and life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Like I said, if any of you out there, if you have been struggling with this, I want to encourage you. Connect with our church here at New Life Fellowship. Send us a private message to our, to our, um, our Facebook page or contact us. Give us a call. And what we'll do is we'll connect with you and have, find someone to talk with you, pray with you if you need some counseling or just to talk through some things. We'd love to connect with you. Even though we're not allowed to meet together as a church, let's stay connected. And we'll help you in your faith. We're one body, we're one church, with one Savior. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you guys all next week. Thank you very much.